there, there's still more to what he did and the understanding of it than, than our minds will ever comprehend. So I was reading a passage of the scripture and there was a thought that came to my, to my heart. And I, I want to just back up to Matthew 26 and we'll pick it up at verse number 47 and you'll recognize that we are in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas is coming to betray him. So that's where we're at. And so Matthew 26 and verse number 47, while he yet say, Lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. And he that had betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and had laid hands on Jesus and took him. Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. We know that's Peter. Then <coughs> said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they, that, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And now that I cannot now pray to my Father, he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be so? The Garden of Gethsemane is one of the um, it's one of the deepest events in the life of Christ. Our, our Lord agonizing the garden, sweating as it were, great drops of blood, a night of prayer uh, before they come to and rest and rest him, and and it opens up the study of prayer in the life of the Lord Jesus. And it's not surprising to us that, that the greatest model of prayer in the Bible would be Jesus Christ Himself. The Gospel revealed to us that He was a man of prayer. And we can learn much about His prayer life. The disciples came to Him in Luke 11 and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught His disciples. They had listened to Him pray. They had watched Him pray. They had prayed with Him. And they wanted to learn to pray as they had observed him praying. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35 says that in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out, went to a solitary place, and there he prayed. What's interesting about that, if you look at the harmony of the gospel, the day before that had been a very unusually busy day, a lot of activity for the Lord Jesus. But even after a very busy day, he still got up early the next day to be able to spend some time in prayer. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 12 says it came to pass in those days that he went into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. That's the example of the prayer, prayed all night. Someone has said that the word pray or prayer is used 25 times in the Gospels in reference to the Lord Jesus. And here's what's interesting about it. If you take a homily of the Gospels, they, they say that, that of the three and a half year ministry of Christ, there was only about a hundred days of activity that are accounted for. The gospel doesn't tell us everything that he did on every day. It just highlights it, takes different things. And really, you only have about a hundred actual days in the three and a half year ministry of the Lord Jesus. And if you have 25 references to prayer in those hundred days, then how many more references to prayer could there be? So our Lord is a man of prayer. I just very quickly, the other day, went down and I just jotted some of these down. He prayed at the beginning of his ministry when he was baptized. He prayed during his early Galilean ministry. He prayed before he chose the twelve disciples. He prayed at the Transfiguration. He prayed when his disciples asked him to pray. He prayed after he fed the 5,000. He prayed when he fed the 5,000. He prayed when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He prayed at the Last Supper. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and of course he prayed on the cross. Jesus always prayed before great events where Christ sees in his life. He always prayed before temptations and trials of his life. He always prayed when his life was unusually busy. He prayed in times of deep anguish and times of great joy. He prayed early in the morning. He prayed late at night. He prayed with his disciples. He prayed alone. He prayed for others. And pray for himself. Now that's just a very cursory introductory look at the life of, of the prayer life of the Lord. And I just want to put it in your mind. 
that our Lord was a man of prayer. And I'm not sure that I fully understand that, to be honest with you. How and why does God pray to God? But Jesus became a man in every sense of the word. Every sense of you and I are. And as a man, he depended upon the strength of the Father and the Holy Spirit during his ministry. You can study the great prayer of Gethsemane a lifetime, and you'll just begin to understand it. Then when you grasp it, go to John 17 and study the high priestly prayer of John 17, and that'll take a lifetime of study. In fact, even now in heaven, our Lord is still praying. He has a ministry of intercession, Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, they will also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So put it in your mind. Our Lord was a man of prayer. Pray constantly. We can learn a lot about the prayer life of the Lord. However, here is the thought that came to my mind this week, is that there is one prayer that Jesus never prayed. Of all the prayers that he prayed, there's one prayer he could have prayed, but he would not pray that prayer. And you ought to be thankful for the intercession ministry of the Lord, but you really ought to be thankful for the prayer that he refused to pray. And that prayer is found in Matthew 26 and verse number 30, 53. When he told his disciples, Think it thou, that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. The Roman soldiers have come to the garden at night to arrest Jesus. Here's the context. Peter draws his sword out to defend him. And Jesus tells Peter to put his sword up that night, because otherwise you're going to start a war that you can't win. He says if you take up the sword, then you're going to die by the sword. But then Jesus said to Peter in so many words, Peter, I don't really need you to defend me. Because I could pray to the Father, and the Father would send twelve legions of angels to rescue me. I could pray that right now, but he didn't. He could have said that it's too much. I'm not going to go through with it. And he could pray to be delivered from the hands of evil men. But had he chosen his own deliverance, he would not have been able to accomplish our deliverance. I'll say it again. Had he chosen his own deliverance, he would not have been able to accomplish our deliverance. So you and I can study the intercessory prayer of the Lord Jesus, and we can be thankful for that. I honestly don't know how He intercedes for me. That there is a mystery to that. But I'm thankful tonight for the prayer that He did not pray. And if you'll think of how close that He was that night to deliver, He is at the very beginning of the sorrows of Calvary. And here's the thing about it: He knew what we needed. What was getting ready to happen was not going to surprise him. He knew the exact events of the next few hours. He knew the arrest, the betrayal, the desertion of the disciples. He knew the trials. He knew the crucifixion. He knew all of that. And knowing every evil thing that men were going to bring against him, that all he has to do is look up in the heaven, pray a quick prayer to the Father, and it will all be over. But he never they say that a legion in the Roman army was between four to 6,000 soldiers. Twelve legions sent by my math would be somewhere around 48 to 72,000. That's a lot. I don't know if there were literally that many angels standing by, or if, 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 if he's using a number to, to say a large a multitude. I, I do know that one angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 men by himself. So 12 legions of angels, 50, 60, tens of thousands of angels, is enough to do the job. I could pray it right now. 
I don't need your card because I can pray and I can end this. But thank God for the prayer that he never prayed. And here's my thought tonight, all right? We'll have communion. Why didn't he pray the prayer? Why would he not pray that prayer? And there's three reasons for it. And the first reason is because the kingdom that he came to bring is spiritual, not carnal. Now remember the context. Look, look back up to verse 51. The old one of them, which was with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. You know what Peter thought he was doing? He thought he was helping Jesus bring in the kingdom. But Jesus tells Peter, it's not going to be this way. It's not going to be by the sword. Many religions have tried to force conversion upon people by the sword. But the kingdom of God doesn't come into the hearts of men by a sword. Now, now here's what's interesting. Now, now we'll, we'll study for just a minute, all right? Hold your finger right here, because there's another statement that Jesus had just made a couple of hours earlier that seems to be contradictory. Look, look if you would, in Luke chapter 25, well, 22. Hold your finger right there. Go to Luke chapter 22. And I, I found this so interesting. This is just a few hours earlier. It's in the upper room at the last Passover. And in Luke 22 and verse number 36, Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his crib. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. I say to you that this, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Now Jesus is talking to them about the kingdom that is coming. And you could read those words as if he is saying, that it's going to take taking up arms. In fact, verse 50, verse 38, they said, Lord, hear us to four. So, so they thought that he said that it's time to take up arms and we have two swords. Eleven men and two swords. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not going to do anything against a Roman army. If he is sending them into armed conflict, then it looks like a suicide mission is what it looks like. All right? But, but instead, what he's saying is that they're going to enter into a new chapter of life to which they're no longer received by the world. They're going to crucify men and they're going to come after you next. And you're going to be scattered and you're going to be persecuted. And your greatest weapon will not be a sword because you're not going to win that way. The greatest weapon that you'll have will be the gospel that you preach. Jesus could have prayed for the Father to send angels, and, 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 and I imagine that they would have come with flaming swords and wipe out the army, but the kingdom is not part. And I want you to think about what Jesus is not saying. The Bible says that Christ is the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. That simply means that redemption was the plan of God before creation. Theologians like to talk about a council of the Godhead, that sometime in eternity past that the Godhead got together and they planned redemption. But do you think that Jesus, when he said that I can pray the Father who sent me 2008, he needs to make, do you think that Jesus is revealing to us that there was an escape clause in the plan of redemption? Do you think that the Father said in his earning past, Now, Son, if, if, you get, if you get there and you change your mind, if you decide that it's not worth it, if you decide that you don't want to suffer these things, if you decide that rebellious men are not worthy of redeeming, then I'll be standing by with some angels ready there for you. you think that's what, I don't believe that's what was happening. Because if that were the case, then it would make no sense for Christ to have agonized in the garden in the first place. Why would he pray? Why would he pray, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me? If all that he had to do was just pray for the angels to come. So the point, the point that Christ is making, 
to Peter and his disciples is that God is given God's desire to advance the kingdom by force. I can do much better than 11 men and two fourths. If this is the way that it's going to be, I'm not relying on you men and your two fours. I have legions of angels at my beck and call. But Christ would not call for armed deliverance, thereby laying down the example for your eyes that we're not going to advance the kingdom by armed conflict either. We go out with a sword, but the sword that we go out with is the sword of the Word of God. He would not advance his kingdom by carnal means, nor does he expect his disciples to do it either. He did not pray that prayer because his kingdom is spiritual, it's not carnal. He said he couldn't pray it. I'm not going to pray it. And the second reason why he didn't pray that prayer is because he was committed to his word. And come back to Matthew 26. I, I love this. I love this. But I wish that you did too. But look at verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father? He shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Over and over in the passion of Christ, Christ has committed that all of the scriptures be fulfilled. You find it again down in verse number 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. He is committed in the entire process that every prophecy of the Old Testament of the Scriptures be fulfilled. And why would he not be? He was the Word himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's the one that wrote the Word. Therefore, he would be concerned that the Word that he wrote, and that he was, would be fulfilled exactly. There are prophecies like Psalm 52, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 12 and verse 10 that says that the Messiah is going to suffer. But if he calls the Father now, then all of those scriptures are going to fall. It's not just his comfort that is at stake. It is the veracity of the Word of God. That's what depended upon whether he praised this prayer or not. He had already said that he would suffer. And if he prays now to escape the suffering, then he's going back on his own word. How about that? He committed to his word. Now here's what that blesses my heart. Men make promises they intend to keep until the circumstances change. And sometimes it becomes more favorable for them to go back on their word. They discovered that they could get a better deal. They could make some more money. They could position themselves in a more favorable position. Their word is good unless a better deal comes along. And most men will lie, and they'll cheat, and they'll fed, and they'll make excuses, and go back on what they promised. But our Lord isn't like that. All throughout the Old Testament, he said that I must need suffer. And when he came to that hour, he's not going to break his word just for his own advantage. Now, that tells you something about the Lord, that he committed to his word. He could pray. And the Father would send 12 legions of angels. He could pray that, but he wouldn't pray that because he'd already given his word that this is what's going to happen. Christ keeps his Word. In the most difficult circumstances, Christ keeps His Word. Keeping His Word meant that He would suffer like no man has ever suffered, but He had given His Word. Isn't that something to be thankful for? I, I mean, I can say it. I, I can say right now, Peter. I can say that, but I'm not going to say it because it's like this. That all of those scriptures would not be fulfilled. Let me pray the prayer. Well, I'll tell you why I didn't pray the prayer. Because it would be inconsistent with the ministry of angels. First Peter 1 and verse 12, we memorize that unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that he ministered the things which are reported unto you by them that preached up unto you. God the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire. 
desire to listen to. The angels are attracted to the glory of God in salvation. They know salvation is not for them, but they worship God. And they know that the glory God gets in redeeming men, and they worship because of it. The angels watched it all as they ministered to Jesus. And angels were join up in Revelation chapter 5 in worshiping the Lamb that was slain. Then how could it be for angels to marvel that Christ would die for men to suddenly be called to put an end to it? It's interesting that there's one other time in the Gospels and the life of Christ when there is a multitude of angels that are present in the ministry of Christ. In Luke chapter 2. And Luke chapter 2 says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward me. There is a multitude of angels at the incarnation. They knew who he was, and they knew why he came. And they knew that the incarnation was just the first step in salvation. And they knew that this redemption was not for them. They knew this redemption was for fallen mankind. And the marvel, the grace, the majesty, the mercy, the glory, what the God of the universe was to go over to save those men. They saw that and they knew why it was coming. That's why at the incarnation they rejoiced and they worshiped and they, and they shouted, Glory to God in the house. And they rejoiced in that. So now it gets to the need. Would Jesus call for these same angels to now come and deliver him from his persecution? Would he call angels who had rejoiced that he had come for this purpose to now put an end to the very purpose that we seek? If you'll study, if you'll study angels in the Bible, you will discover that angels had a record of delivering God's people from trouble. Second Kings chapter six, Elisha is in the city of Samaria, and the Syrians had it surrounded, and the servant is scared. And Elisha comes out and looks and says, "Lord, open his eyes." He sees the hills are filled with a heavenly host, angels are encountering, ready to deliver them. And then, and then the Assyrians have Jerusalem under assault, and, and that's where God sends one angel and wipes out a hundred and eighty-five thousand Assyrians at one time. Angels are familiar with the mission of reaching God's people. But for Christ to have offered his deliverance, would have meant you would have no deliverance. And it's interesting to me that an angel did minister to Jesus at this time. Oh, yeah, the Bible says in Luke 22 and verse 43, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Angels celebrated the salvation that he would bring and they ministered to him in the dark. The God of Christ would never call for those angels to perform a duty that was counter to their ministry. I am thankful for the intercessory ministry of Christ. I don't know how he prays for me, but I'm thankful that he does pray. But tonight I'm thankful for the prayer that he never at any moment, at any moment, he could have cried out and it was all in order. And there would have been no salvation for you and me. He would not pray that prayer. And because he wouldn't pray that prayer, I stand before you tonight, rejoicing in the salvation that he has accomplished. The prayer that Jesus never prayed.